Actually, I was on a plane. I had just flew out of Newark Airport that morning. So um, what happened was that I was flying out for work. I, I got on a plane at 7.30 in the morning, and I landed in Toronto for a meeting in Toronto. Um, and I touched on the ground, and I got in my rental car. And didn't know anything had happened. No, nothing was said on the plane. Uh, got in my rental car. Heard on the news for two seconds about a plane hitting World Trade Center, and I'm thinking that it's a little plane. You know, you heard these little stories before. Shut off the radio, left the message at home. Uh, got to a meeting and everybody's staring at me with their eyes glaring at me like what are you doing here? How did you get here? I'm like, what are you talking about? And they just took me by the hand and They brought me into a room and the entire building was watching the news and watching the, the trade center burning And I'm like, what are we watching? And I couldn't understand it I, I it couldn't I couldn't make the, the connection that it was reality I was watching on television and these guys and I'm staring there and I'm like is, is that what's going on? And they're explaining what happened to me and it still wasn't sinking in And I remember somebody coming over my shoulder going we just booked you a hotel because you're gonna be stuck here And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I was supposed to leave same day and like, I think you're going to be here. All the planes are being diverted into Canada. Um, nobody has a place to stay, but we got your hotel room. And I go, I guess I can stay for a night. And they're like, no, you're going to be here a little bit longer. I got you three, four nights. And I'm like, okay. Um, and then it started to sink in. And then I tried to call back to New York. I couldn't get through. Couldn't get through. Couldn't get through. And now I'm starting to get a little panicky. You know, I got, a, I got nephews who work down on, on, on Wall Street. I got friends who work at one police plaza. I got family everywhere around New York. And you're wondering what the hell's going on because the information just wasn't getting through. And all you're seeing is what's going on in the news. And it was all sporadic. And I just remember spending the next three days in Canada trying to get out and not being able to. And it wasn't until that Friday uh, when they opened up the border at 5 a.m. that I was able to get a car. Avis did this wonderful deal, which you can just go one way. Um, and I got a car and drove from Toronto to Newark Airport because my car was still at Newark. And I got to the airport, and it's a ghost town. And you're wondering what's going on, and you know what's happening. And I get home, and it's good to be home. Just one of the few times I did a lot of traveling, it's one of the first times I could say it felt really good to be home. And so that was weird. And just the whole surreal aspect of what was New York at that time was weird. And then when you put it on top of that, I mean, I got back on a plane because I did a lot of traveling. Got back on a plane the following Wednesday and there's 12 people on the plane. And the pilot comes out and introduces himself to everybody. And there's a sense of camaraderie on a plane that I've never experienced before. And the pilot's like, we're all in this together. And it was just this weird feeling, just walking through the airports that were bustling. There were ghost towns now. Being on a plane, there was, you know, every seat was full, and now you're just sitting. You can barely see the next person. And uh, for me, it was an experience because then, two weeks after that, I did my first trip to, to Europe. And I went over to MIPCOM. Um, and everybody that came from North America was greeted with such open arms and such welcome and you can see the expression on the faces of the people coming to you and saying we're so glad you were able to make it because that had the, the pale on it as well and it, you can see that for the first time I've ever saw everybody just uniting around an event or, a, or situation you know I'm of an age where everything you're in between everything so this was a defining moment um, and it was an interesting moment in, in my life as you saw it progress and then ultimately you watch the world get back to normal again um, you know, a new normal. A new normal, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's my story. <laughs> I was working for a company called Mainframe Entertainment. Uh, we were based in Vancouver, so that's why I was actually flying a lot. So actually, I was literally flying from Newark to Toronto that morning and from Toronto to Vancouver that afternoon. So my other flight naturally never made it, yeah. and, and I was pretty much... I was pretty much uh, landlocked in Toronto, and I had a lot of things to do there, but I couldn't do anything. I just, just wanted to get home. What happened with me is that I was, work, I was doing a lot of flying, and actually what was one of the deciding factors for me actually to switch jobs a little because I was on the airs a little bit too much and actually wanted to be home a little bit more. So ultimately what happened is I met Paul Levitz, and we found out a way to bring me into DC Comics, and I found a way to work myself in and, and, and and be part of the process. And going into work in Manhattan, something I hadn't done for years, uh, the first thing that I saw different was that there were, there were armed National Guard at Port Authority, something that didn't exist before. You get, off, um, you get off the bus and you see people with machine guns. I always use this expression, see people with machine guns. And I've been in the, I've been in the UK and you've seen the guys with the machine guns in Heathrow. Never saw it at Port Authority before. And it was extraordinarily disconcerting. And now you understand that this is now part of your life. And now that you're working in superhero comics, and now that I'm working in, in this, this new medium for me, which was, was comic books, you know, you had to examine what the word hero meant 
again, you had to redefine it. Uh, because when the stories start coming out from what happened around the Trade Center, how, how people ran back into the building in self-sacrifice to save others, a hero was redefined to be the ordinary man, not somebody who's brightly clad in costume, but somebody who was, 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 was us. And because of that, it forced us to redefine hero and also what it took to be a hero. And that's something that we decided slowly to integrate into our stories and really try to build it around. And when we created a series called Identity Crisis, it was really about the redefinition of the term hero as the world defined it around us. And we looked at what the books were and the, the tonality of the books felt changing. The art style started to change. The sensibilities started to change. You felt it started to seep into it naturally through the creators because the, it's, their lives have changed. So you feel their writing changing and their art changing. Um, but from us, we as a company looked at the, how our heroes would determine, how our heroes were defined and decided to redefine them to the new time. There's, there's a couple of interesting stories there. I mean, the, the, I mean Paul Levitz, who was the, the president and publisher at the time uh, during September 11th, uh, stepped out from the president and publisher's desk and actually became an editor again. And, and you saw on his face the level of personal, personal pride in the product that he took in building the two September 11th books uh, that really brought together so many, so many different creators who wanted to participate, who wanted to express themselves, wanted to have a voice. Uh, and they took their time and crafted these two wonderful volumes in conjunction with another publisher and really built out what we feel is, is a beautiful volume to express so many different ways how people were affected uh, by that. Again, our own stories took on a little bit of heavier pale. We started to feel it in our characters and books a little bit more. And again, like I said, we, we let the, the, the sensibility seep in. We really didn't want to define it in the books as much, but we did let the, uh, the sensibilities come in to uh, how the world had changed. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, I mean, the, the, the double-edged sword of this is because we tell comics, we tell fiction stories. The weirdness of this all is that prior to the events of September 11th, we actually had a Superman story where a plane, uh, the president's plane was flying through New York City, uh, hitting into buildings, you know, with like when Lex Luthor was a president, um, which is, you know, naturally, you know, something that was, you know, you look back and you say, we really didn't want it. We really wish we had, you know, hadn't published that at the moment. Um, yeah, it came out right at the time that you got pulled from the stand. Yes, it did, exactly. Can you tell that story just very briefly? Sure. What, ha what happened was that we had a storyline running, taking place in comics at the moment. And, you know, the, what they were doing is they were doing a big fiction story using Lex Luthor as a president, big, you know, bold. And what happened is that his Air Force One was, was taking control over and it was literally being flown through New York's uh, metropolis to crash into buildings. Simple as that. Uh, and that literally was about to come out uh, just when September 11th happened. And because of that, we saw it. It looked in completely insensitive naturally to what was happening. And because of that, we actually had to pull, pull, the, uh, pull the material because of that as it, as it was occurring. Um, on the other side, though, once everything had happened, um, Wildstorm, which is a brand of, was one of the branches of DC Comics, um, was about to launch a new book later down the line. And this is from the events, spinning out from the events, from the September 11th. And then they launched this incredibly well, beautiful book called Ex Machina, uh, written by Brian K. Vaughan and Tony, Tony Harris. And the, the last page of the very first issue is that you find out they saved one of the two towers. And that's the defining moment for the lead character and how the story spins out from there. So again, you see an immediate reaction to the fiction and also something that just was accidental that had to be changed because of the fiction, because of the reality, I should say, you know? So it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting one too, looking at the bookends in one case. In one side, it was wildly in, felt wildly inappropriate because of the moment. The other one felt almost like a necessity, like you had to go on and, and, and find a way to help matters by, by, by expressing it in the story. It's, it has been, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's interesting for something that we took so much for granted now becomes such a, um, an iconic symbol for so many different things, you know? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a stamped period in time now. Well, it, it, and it just shows, it, you know, it's interesting that, um, for me always, when you look at how the emergence of superheroes, and the superhero started to emerge during the 1940s, uh, during 
the, the advent of World War II and throughout World War II when they became it, when again, heroism was being redefined again. Heroism was, 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 was part of the psyche, you know, committing yourself, you know, you know, giving your life out. It was part of an understanding that people did for a cause. Um, and the hero stepped out and it became the colorful, iconic images of what the hero stood for in those days. And in those days, they were used as inspiration, as motivation for people to go out and, and be involved and be part of things. And you always have those iconic shot of the heroes, you know, join now or buy bonds or anything, things. And as much as you had people of so many different likes doing that, the heroes got involved in that process too, even though they were fictional characters. Um, so to see when Alex Ross puts on the cover of, uh, of the, the DC 9-11 uh, book uh, with him looking at the fireman, the policeman, the, the, the average man, and Superman, and I think Crypto's in the picture too, and Crypto's there, and you see the two of them standing side by side looking up and going, wow, you know that there is something that's just happened that made the average man so impressive to a Superman. And I think that's what uh, is so strong and so vibrant about that particular image. I mean, it was interesting for me because, again, because I had just started in D.C. right afterwards, you know. I started in D.C. in January, February of 2002. So everything was very much still in the psyche out there, and the stories were still being told about how the company and the people were affected. And one of our goal was to try to get that sensibility into, into the storytelling. You know, get that, get that in, you know, not for a cathartic sense, but also from a sense to, so that we think it's going to be relatable to everybody. Because I think if we're feeling it, we know the entire city's feeling it, but this is one time that you know that it went far beyond the city. It's, it went out throughout the world and it made that much of an impact. And if, if, if we are affected in that way, we know others are affected and it's important for us to be able to relate so that we are able to associate with, with the people who read our books. And the heart of the industry is in New York City. Absolutely. It's, we're very spread out, but it, it, like I said, this was a defining moment and a, and, a, and a unifying moment. Everybody felt like there were New Yorkers at this time. And, uh, you know, and you, you know, you're probably never more proud of New York than this particular moment, without a doubt.